Thank you. So everybody is most welcome. I really appreciate people joining us. Just to say that we are recording this because many people will watch it later on Facebook and it's live on Facebook as well. And I'll just give a general introduction to this series and then I'll welcome our guests, all of whom are in Israel. And we're really very, very grateful to you for giving us your time and for joining us. Um, it's com Israel is a complicated country and we Jews are a complicated people. And how we relate to Israel is not a simple matter. I've always felt personally that commitment to the existence and well-being of Israel is an unquestionable responsibility for a Jewish person. But how we relate to Israel through what channels, what it means to us, what our views are there, that's what democracy debate and the Jewish tradition of, of arguments um, and discourse is really all about. But being aware that the last period of time has been extremely difficult, and we also want to acknowledge that it's been difficult living in Israel, um, and that you, you're all joining us after a really tough time. It's also very complicated, particularly for young people, to know how to relate, facing quite a lot of hostility here in Britain, on campuses and elsewhere. So we thought that we would prepare a short series, the three in this initial series, on looking at on looking at Israel and different faces of Israel with the ultimate question, what does it mean to be uh, a Masorti Jewish committed Zionist in today's times? And this is the first session of three. I'll just say a little bit about each of them and then we'll come to today's session. The, this one will be about serving Israel more shortly, more shortly. The second session will be about Israeli-Palestinian coexistence, and we've been very, very aware that one of the most disturbing features during May and the beginning of June was the civil conflict within what had been shared cities like Lud, like Yafo, like Haifa, and that, that has been profoundly upsetting, not just sort of physically, but spiritually to the soul of the country. And the third session will be out about religious pluralism in Israel, something of particular concern to progressive and Masorti Jews where orthodoxy is, is the norm and tends to have the power. This will be an initial series, and if there is interest, we'll pursue it in more depth in the coming year, also with study of sources on the history of Jewish, of Zionism, and looking at, and looking at traditional texts as well. But for tonight, we want to welcome three guests who have been kind enough to give us their time. Abital, Abital Cooper, you served in the army in a mixed combat unit in the Bradalas Battalion, and you finished your service, I think, just over a year ago. I've also got in my notes, I was given that you love sports and music and hiking. Many, you know, we probably all share those loves, and you hope to start a traveling adventure soon. And we're going to ask you to speak first. We'll be followed by Joel, Joel Carmel. You grew up in London, not far away. You're for, for people who, who, who maybe just can't quite click. Uh, your, your, your parents are Rabbi Chaim and Judy Lina, and you're very involved in Noam UK in the Masorti community. You went to study at uh, Yeshivat Ma'ale Giboa in the north of Israel, made Aliyah, enlisted in the IDF, served as an officer in the coordination of government activities in the territories. And now you're married, you have a little daughter, I've seen wonderful pictures, and you are spokesman for Breaking the Silence, an NGO of former IDF soldiers that campaigns to bring the occupation to an end. Alon, Alon Veltman, you're, you're familiar to our community from bringing groups of soldiers of combat in combat units some years after they complete their service through peace of mind which is a charity that helps IDF combat veterans to process their combat experiences. You yourself have a master's in psychology and, um, and um, is a medical, you're a medical psychologist um, with a res residency at Hadassah in Karim. Um, and we've really seen the profound impact of the work that you do because our community has been able to host at least four groups of such soldiers, which has had a deep effect on us. And I understand a lasting impact on how they process now back in civilian life, the challenging experience 
of being at the front line of Israel's defense. So the plan is that I'm going to ask very broad leading questions in turn to each of the three of you. And then I'm gonna ask each of you to comment on something which you know maybe may be challenging or very different that one of the others of you has said. And then there'll be time for questions. And we will keep though within the hour and finish at uh, 8 p.m. UK, 10 p.m. Um, Israeli time. So Avital, just maybe, uh, you know, of your army service, I'm sure there are many things which stand out, but I wanted to ask you first of all, uh, about one or two key experiences that form your sense of, of being in a combat unit in the IDF, in Saha. Um, so uh, I think, um... I think really the the experiences that I felt um, that were really that made my that that I'm that I think when I think back of, uh, of my service is uh, while I was serving in the in the West Bank. Um, I most of my service I served in uh, I was guarding uh, peace borders with uh, Jordan and Egypt. Um, and that was that was, I guess, uh, more like a routine. Oh, sorry. Um, more like a, just like a routine, uh, everyday army routine experience. I don't know. So not, not very, uh, something that stands out, but while I was in the West Bank, uh, I think I had some, uh, very harsh interactions, um, with Palestinian, with Palestinians. And, uh, I can tell about one, uh, one, uh, experience that I had. I hope I can I can uh, express myself well because it's pretty hard translating uh, army terms. Um, but I um, I remember this one experience that I was on a patrol mission uh, with my um, uh, you, with some of the other people in my unit, um, and we were we were on like an army road that it's not allowed uh, for civilians to to be around there. And uh, there was, and there was this car coming our way, um, just like not an army vehicle, just like a regular, a regular car. Uh, we stopped them over, and there were two women there. One looked in their in her forties, and her mother, I think, was like an old lady in her eighties. Uh, they were Arab ladies, and uh, we asked them where what what they're doing there. They said we we asked. Uh, I mean, they're not supposed to be there. And uh, they said, "Oh, we we just we got lost. We're on the way to the hospital. Um, that, like uh, we will turn around." And so we were. My commander asked me to take their IDs to ask for their IDs. Um, and uh, I think and they didn't have their IDs on them. So long story short, we 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 had to be there for hours with them because they said they were from Umm Fahim, which is a, a there was a village inside. They it's it's inside Israeli territory. They have um, I, Israeli IDs, like they're citizens of Israel, as they claim, and we couldn't let them go because they didn't have their IDs on them. And so we had to wait for hours, and it was a whole mess. And they were and and after. And eventually, their hus her husband got got the got the IDs, and he and he came, and and he, and we let them go. And I came up to her, and I said, like, listen, the whole situation was really like I felt so uncomfortable, and I was like, I I, I told her, listen, I'm sorry for the mess. I mean, we really had no choice. And um, and she she re responded in like in a room in a way I, I'll never forget. Like she was. Like uh, she said to me, I, I hope you you be treated like you treat us, and uh, I don't know some curse word, and I don't know, and they drove off. Um, and I think like this is it's a this was a really specific experience that made me um, just realize the whole uh, how complicated this whole my whole service was, and thousands of Israelis that go through the same. Um, and, and, and I was serving in a unit that barely does anything very dangerous or, um, or stuff like that. And uh, I think that was like an experience that I'll remember. Um, and uh, I don't know, that's something that I think back on when I think of tough or out, like something that stands out for me. You described that very, very vividly and uh, very compellingly. Um, now you're a year after your army services, you're looking forward to sort of travels. What sort of, I mean, Maybe you've already answered the question, but in general, what sort of feelings has it left you, the experience of serving Israel in, you know, in the active army, 
Yeah. What sort of thoughts and feelings has it left you about, about Israel? Um, pride, complexity? Yeah, I think, um, well, all through, also while I was in the army and also after I was dealing with these questions, like what am I doing and how am I feeling about this? And do I feel comfortable with everything I'm doing? And how am I gonna feel after? And I think it's everything combined. Like it, it's very like, with all these moral questions that, that are raised while serving, also a sense of pride and fulfill and it's very fulfilling and you do stuff that some of them you think wow it's so necessary I'm protecting my family I'm protecting my country and I my parents uh, made aliyah from the U.S. and like I was raised on Zionist uh, values and so I was it's part of the reasons that I chose to go into a combat unit and I'm I was very proud of that and while all through my basic training it was such a uh, 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 challenging and a uh, good experience, but I think I came out of it just thinking that it's so, even, like even more confused than what I came in. Like it's so complicated. I'm such a small part of this whole big thing. And so um, you can just be like, the best person you can be. Uh, that, <laughs> I don't know, that's I guess what I got out of it. There's something in there about the older one gets, the less one knows. Um, you describe that also very movingly, that's the best person one can be. Um, what do you feel, my last question to you, your, your, your comrades, your peers, people who served with you or friends of yours, in general, do you have a sense of the feelings that, pe that people bring when they, you know, when they come out of the army, where, 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 you know, where your peer group is at? I think, uh, I mean, the it's part of the whole, the reason that is young Israelis after the army need to travel, need to get out of the country. And, uh, and, get, and I mean, we gave three years or two years um, for the country and, and uh, some of us are proud of that and some of us less. I mean, everyone, it's very individual how people get out of the army, like with a sense of, uh, wow, I did something so great or like, what did I, it's very personal, but I think in general, pe young people like me and my friends who just finished the army, we just want to have take like a moment to ourselves. I think it's like a very um, we we, we want to be selfish, like after after the army and just um, and and go out and travel and forget about a bigger cause and the country and just focus on on us and on what we and on living our lives. Uh, for ourselves. I think that's a big part of my uh, last few months and years to be, I guess. But if your travels bring you to the UK, you will be made very welcome. Thank you. We're going to come back to you a little bit later. I also think it's perhaps something that we who grew up in countries where there's no compulsory military service don't understand, actually, that you give years to the service of your country. It would be much more familiar to my parents' generation and appreciate what you say. Going to come to you, Joel, um, you served in the IDF um, as an officer, and then you came to work for Breaking the Silence. And I want to ask, first of all, you know, about your, you know, what, what you took from your experiences in the army, what, what um, maybe there are one or two sort of key experiences that you could, that you could recount. Yeah, um, thank you very much, first of all, for putting on this excellent series, and uh, it's, it's a really great honour to, to have been invited to speak. Um, I, uh, as probably many people in this audience know, I grew up in London, uh, in the Mussorgsky community, and I um, was always very involved in uh, anything to do with Israel, I always felt a very strong Israeli identity. Uh, and it was clear to me from quite a young age that I was going to, um, I was going to live in Israel um, sooner rather than later. And uh, I, I made that a reality when I was 18 and I, I packed up my things. And um, after a year in Yeshiva, I went, uh, um, I made Aliyah and then a year later I was, uh, drafted to the IDF. Um, I went to a unit called uh, Coordination of Government Activities in the Territories, COGAT. Um, and 
I was posted uh, at the beginning on the border of Gaza. And uh, after about a year, I went to an uh, officer's training course. Uh, and then I was posted uh, in the Janim district uh, in the civil administration, which is basically the unit that governs day-to-day -day life in the occupied territories. Um, and that was quite a, uh, it, was, it was a difficult experience for me. I think coming into the army, I, I kind of had an understanding of uh, the complexity of what I was, of, of what the occupation was about and um, the moral difficulties. Um, but I kind of thought, um, a bit like what Avital said, that I would be the best person I could be. Um, and I, I really wanted to be a, a good soldier and a good officer and have a, maybe a good influence on the soldiers around me and to try to improve um, the lives of the Palestinians who I was in, in contact with. Um, and I think one particular moment that really stands out for me is um, uh, one night I, I understood that my, um, there were some combat soldiers on my base. I wasn't a combat a soldier, but there was combat soldiers on my base going on what's called a mapping mission. Um, and I had heard about mapping missions, but I was both curious and also wanted to, uh, I wanted to do this thing, being being the good soldier and, and influencing the situation for the better. Um, and I found myself at about one o'clock in the morning uh, going out in a jeep with these these other soldiers into a Palestinian village, and uh, we we were divided into small teams when we arrived in the village, uh, and we were each given a list of of addresses, uh, and we my team went to the first address, and I remember we banged on the door, and the homeowner um, opened up. He was obviously petrified to see a group of soldiers. Uh, armed from head to toe uh, in the middle of the night. And we told him, wake everyone up, uh, including the children, bring them all downstairs to the, um, to the entrance of the house. And, uh, um, and we want to ask you some questions. And the commander, he, he was obviously very, um, he did exactly what we said. And the commander starts asking him questions. Where do you... Um, what are your names? What are your ID numbers? Where do you work? And so on. Uh, and I, I remember looking at the children there who were very young, six, eight, ten-year-olds. Um, and I remember thinking to myself, this must be terrifying for them. Uh, and we're not here to cause them any harm at all. And I wanted to somehow convey that we are, we're okay. We're not there to hurt them. Um, and since the questioning was happening at the same time, the only way I could convey that was to uh, to smile. Um, and they didn't smile back. And that was really a moment that for me was was very powerful when I realized that I, you know, I was the, you know, nice uh, English boy who came to serve my country and I was trying to be a good person. And from the children's point of view, I was a scary soldier with a rifle who had just effectively woken them up from their beds in the middle of the night. Um, and I recalled that before that, the, the uh, company commander in the briefing before the mission had said, we're going to these houses in the middle of the night and not in the middle of the day because we want to show them who's boss. Those were his, his words. We have to show them who's boss. And that really made me realize a lot more of what this was about. Um, that I, if I had previously thought that this was about kind of protecting Israelis and, and um, the security of my, uh, my fellow Israelis, then now I was thinking, well, this showing them who's boss is really about control. Um, and I basically, I realized that I, with all of my attempts to be the best person I could be, I, I don't think that I could have changed anything in that situation because the mission itself was to wake people up in the middle of the night. And did um, that take you, was that the experience that took you then to breaking the silence? That was definitely, 
it was definitely one of the most uh, the most important experiences I had. I had several others, um, but there was this moment of realization that that there's an element of control here. And I, it took me a while. And like Avital, I didn't immediately after the army. I didn't want to think about any of this, and I put it all aside. Um, and I, you know, I, I traveled a bit, and I went to university, and. Um, only a few years later, I kind of realized that I wanted to do something about this. And I wanted to enter the world of activism uh, and to share my story. Uh, and that's how I came to Breaking the Silence, which is an organization that collects testimonies of soldiers who served in the occupied territories. Uh, and I, I was very proud to join an organization that does that in order to, to say this isn't something that we feel is in either the Palestinians or in Israel's interest. And therefore we, we want to bring the occupation to an end. Thank you. I wanna ask you a slightly different question if it's okay, because um, you know, we're, we're having these sessions as Masorti Judaism, mm -hmm. and you spent a year in yeshiva. To what extent was it the text values that you studied, did, are they what led you in the direction you went? Did they lead you in a, you know, did they pull you in a different direction? Mm -hmm. How does it relate to your to your Jewish identity rooted in profound Torah study? I think um, I think that it was something that not necessarily began in yeshiva. It was um, really values that I brought from uh, young childhood. Uh, this just this idea of general respect for other human beings. Uh, was something that was very deeply rooted into me from my uh, my parents and my community and from Noam and uh, and the school I went to. Um, f firstly, that the idea of just loving other people um, and respecting them. And later, it, I kind of understood a bit more uh, specifically. I think um, uh, the idea, I think it's in Veikra, it says, Mishpat echad yelachem ger kaizrach, which means you should have one, uh, one law for everyone, both citizens and for uh, outsiders. And that was something that I definitely didn't see in the West Bank. I saw two separate sets of laws. And I think that it was very, um, I think it was a, a powerful moment for me to realize that this is something that goes against what I had been brought out to believe. A last question for you, just a, just, just a, there's, there's no opportunity to answer this expansively, I'm sorry about that, but you will have entered the army with a peer group and with friends and, and so on. Did they, did they, their experiences in the army lead them in very different directions or in similar directions, or is there no generalization possible to that? I think it's uh, quite hard to remain um, unmoved by experiences in the army because often they're very extreme. They bring us to extreme places. Uh, and I think my general experience is that the people who were a little bit right wing became more right wing and the people who were a little bit left wing became more left wing. And some people just didn't want to have anything to do with that afterwards. Um, but I, I think that um, when we're brought into these kind of very difficult and unnatural situations, it does bring out the kind of often a, a, a political response and understanding that this, you know, this is part of a bigger story. And yeah, that's something that is shared uh, with most people I know who went to the army. And thank you very much, Joel. And I'm um, going to come to Alon now and just ask you, you, you have a, a, a career already, mid-career, I guess. Um, I don't know to what extent you know, army experience took you in the direction that you've gone in terms of being a, being a therapist. Um, and looking at people's experiences of trauma, is is that where it came from for you, or did it come from different? You know, that direction of your career come from from elsewhere that um, led you to peace of mind. 
So I would, I would again like to start with, with thanking you for inviting me for this, uh, for the series and for this uh, um, talk today. And I think it's very interesting what we can learn from such discussions. And I'm very glad to keep on participating in them because meeting communities and understanding the need for connection is also something that's very connected to where I came to this uh, from the beginning. I wasn't a combat soldier myself. Uh, my medical profile didn't allow me. I was supposed to be a combat soldier, but I ended up serving in a special operations unit, not in a combat role. Um, and it was a very conflictual time. Uh, there was a lot going on, but I think what possibly led me to the trauma field altogether, I grew up in a kibbutz in Kfar Etzion, in Gush Etzion, south of Jerusalem, which is a place that in the War of Independence in 1948 was taken over by the Jordanians. And I knew people that were children of people who were there and who died there. And the story is a very central thing, that, a very central idea that I grew up with. Uh, and it's and that, of course, and serving in the military like many other Israelis. And it always fascinated me how people tell their stories about military and combat and very, very difficult experiences. Many times you ask yourself, but how did that make you feel? What's, what's behind that? How, how are you with that? Um, many times people talk about their, or I heard people talking about their military experiences in a very dry uh, way or in a way that you can feel that there is much emotion behind it but it's not expressed in words. It's expressed in all kinds of other ways, many times in anger and all kinds of different states. And that fascinated me. Um, and actually I came to the trauma field and I think that has, this has a lot to do with this discussion and with peace of mind altogether, because as I see it after traumatic experiences, people search for meaning. And, and much, much of what I think trauma therapists are about is trying to find meaning and trying to find the rest of the story and trying to find a continuum with the before, during, and the after these events. And I think that's what we do in Peace of Mind. And I just, I just mentioned, you just mentioned, you just reminded me, each of you has reminded me of experiences of my own so I didn't serve, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure I didn't serve in the army, but, but um, I lived in Jerusalem for a year after I finished my studies and, and I, I was a carer for a very elderly man whose wife was in hospital for a while with leukemia. And during one of those days, he took me into a room in his flat, which I hadn't known even existed. He opened the door and on the desks were photographs. And he said he was not well himself. He was at the early stages of dementia. And he said, I can't go to a minion. I'm going to say, Kaddish, you are going to respond. This is my daughter, and this is her fiance. Look at these beautiful pictures. They perished in 1948 in Kuaretzion. And I'll never wow. forget, I'll never forget that. Wow. You, you mentioned anger, um, uh, you know, unpacked experiences. Um, yours is a sort of a, a, a different role from the others. Can I ask you how, as people unpack those experiences, how does it shape their lives? What, 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 what impact does that have on them? Because by now you will have worked with hundreds, if not thousands of former combat soldiers. It's, it's fascinating every time, every, every time to see where people take it. But I think that in Israel altogether, even without serving in a combat unit, we talk a lot about a survival mode. A mode that you enter when you once you feel that you're in some kind of danger you need to be alert a little more than than you can be at usual and many times people are not really uh, they don't really appreciate and many many times they're not aware of the fact that they're in that mode and so i many times i like to ask people at the beginning of the the process how many times do you go from the trunk of your car to your house when you come back with groceries from the supermarket and how do you treat your boss at work? And if you're in the middle of something, is it okay to leave it, stop, do something else that just came up and then come back or you have to stay on a mission that you started? And many, many people don't even realize how much they're still in soldier mode, how much they're still in combat mode during their civilian life in the way they try to connect with others. 
And so I think that has been the, the, um, the central change that people experience after peace of mind. They can understand, they can first, first of all be aware of where they are on that spectrum and they can have more choice on how they want to lead their lives. And one of the most meaningful things that we hear is that their interpersonal relationships with their children, with their spouses, with their parents, something opens up. Something is much more flexible. You have a language that you can speak. You can understand how to relate to those things many times because you have processed either that anger or that sadness or that guilt or shame or whatever it is from your military service. And we, uh, as trauma therapists, we work with people who have uh, experienced traumatic experiences in their, in their service, losing a friend, seeing very difficult sites on the battlefield, all kinds of issues like that. I think I remember, I think it was perhaps you or one of the therapists who came with one of the groups who said to us that one of the great thank yous you had was from a soldier's wife who said, you gave me my husband back. Um, yes. Thank you. I'm going to just ask, I'm, I'm just looking at something each of you has said to ask, to ask one of, you know, to ask one of, one of you about it. Um, we've got about, you know, we've got about 25 minutes. We still have some time. Uh, Abital, the phrase that Alon used about being in survival mode, um, is that something that you yourself felt or you've seen in, in others? And that process of return to civilian life, how, have, you know, you're only a year out, so you haven't had that much time to reflect on it. How have you seen that? And how do you think the military service has affected your view of life in general? Um, I think, um, I'm not sure about the term survival mode or if I'm feeling that exactly, but I can relate to, um, to the, to like the mindset of it's, it's hard to, to get out of the mindset of the army. Like you're, you, we have this game in the end of the service, um, that we try using, like we try eliminating words that are, that are, uh, that, that you use only in the army, like for regular things, like, um, I don't know, there are all kinds of words that, like an army language, that as like, in the end of the service, we try to, uh, to like, to, uh, ma to make ourselves speak in a normal way, <laughs> just so we can go out to the, when we finish, um, we wanna totally like, be uh, free and not uh, think in army terms. And I think it takes a while. It takes a while uh, after when you start a job. I I started working uh, in gardening after like a few months after after I got out, and uh, it was amazing. But like I I and but I I got up at, like there were so many things that reminded me of of the army. Like I got up every morning at five thirty in the morning, and I and the whole relationship with your boss. You have to you have to like try and change your your mind to like okay i'm not i'm not he's not my commander he's my boss it takes it it takes a while really uh um make, to to get yourself to uh really uh let it go i think um so i can relate on in in terms of that thank you and did did people say to you did you have friends who forgive me for asking this you said you know you you're a different person now <laughs> um, I, um, I think after a while, because, because everyone does the army and everyone finishes and all my friends, uh, we uh, mostly get, got out in the same time, finished at the same time. So we're all going through this process together and we go into the army together and, and you change, but because it's such a cultural thing, everyone does it together and so it's it's uh, hard to see. It's like just part of your it's part of your duties, and you do it, and you finish, and it doesn't seem like you're changing. Although it was three it was three whole years or two whole years, it's it's a big part of your growing up. Um, but I don't think I mean maybe people that you've been in the army with, and then you don't see for a year after, and all of a sudden uh, guys that have uh, like hair and beards. And like you're not used to seeing to seeing them like that and uh, being a lot more free but i don't know i guess um just because we all do this thing together it seems so natural uh finishing the army and everyone acting like they act because we act in a very similar way i think after we like we have similar 
uh, habits after we get out of uh, growing, if it's the way you look and if it's the places you go travel and we're all, we're kind of all changing together. So it doesn't really seem like we're changing. After his uh, schooling, my son did a year in Ecuador and he said things were in Spanish and Hebrew everywhere. <laughs> the signs, <Yeah. laughs> those were the languages. Um, and just changing the order a bit, Alon, um, because we're also, you know, we're interested in different people's views and, and identities and so on. Um, Joel had said, you know, you know, on the whole, I think it was Joel who said it, it, it makes um, people become more so the army experience, that people who are tending towards the left tend to become more on the left and people tending towards the right become more on the right. Is that your experience of, of, of that, that, it, that it deepens the direction which people sort of seem to have anyway? And does the experience of peace of mind sometimes, you know, substantially alter people's views and attitudes towards this very difficult situation with which all Israelis have to live? I think I, I can't say that, that that is my impression, that it drives people to, deeper into where they were, um, but I don't really have data on that. So I, I don't know, I, we didn't assess that. Um, but my impression is that many times what people are very much busy with in our groups, one is the experiences and processing them, and the other is the relationship between the people that they serve together with. And usually they don't really have a very rich and a very emotional and a very civilian way to really discuss the intricacies and, and very delicate things together. The way that you are able to discuss things, and possibly some of you have heard that in Israelis all together, many times discussions are a complicated thing in Israel. Usually the, the quiet that everyone else now is experiencing is many, many times if people talk in, in Israel, the people will come into other people's uh, words and, and it's not that, it's not that uh, regulated. And I think that many times people don't really have the way to enrich the way they see these experiences because it does take them to the, the experiences themselves are extreme. So they take you many times to the extreme. I don't know if it makes you more right if you are right or more left if you are left. But I think that what we're able to do in peace of mind is enable people to process their experiences, understand themselves better, and understand the way they would like to choose, what they would, how they want to lead their lives. And we don't talk about politics, so to speak, but sometimes, of course, people convey their, their, uh, their views. But that's not, that's not the angle that we're looking at things from. We're looking at how was that for you and how is it for you now and how do you come possibly come to terms or possibly find yourself again now after these experiences whatever they were together with your friends who will accept you if you're left or right or however you are and doing that I feel brings people to to, to be much more able to see things more complicatedly, to see things in a way that they can find themselves in, and to see things less in extreme. I think that's that's what we enable, and it's interesting because many times in, in, in these past few months, of course, the discussion has, has really got to, to the extremes. And I think I see part of what we're doing in Peace of Mind is enabling people to speak in a different way, in a different language to one another about these issues but not in a way that it's anger that's driving them many times. That's extremely relevant to us because what happens also in the diaspora, you know, a classic comment is, as a community rabbi, you don't say anything about Israel, do you? Because whatever you say will be wrong. Um, and I think, you know, they also said, Israel used to unite the Jewish people. Now it's the thing you find it very difficult to talk about because people are very afraid of the difference of views. And, Part of what we want to do is, is, is enable discourse about Israel. Um, so, yeah, helping people have a, have a language and opportunity to reflect on their experiences. And I should say just, I didn't count the hours, but when a group of, of former soldiers comes for a week, it feels like there's 20 or 30 hours of group therapy. 40. It's, it's 40, wow, wow. Um, Joel, it, it, in breaking the silence, 
the, you know, Alon had used the phrase, what people are looking for is a search for meaning. Is, is, this, is this part of a way of trying to give meaning to difficult experience? And I would imagine that, I, am I right or wrong in thinking that, 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 that you, you encounter people with very, very different views and different experiences? Yeah, I think uh, for a lot of people, there's a, there's a certain search for meaning after the army, and uh, it can take them in all kinds of directions. And I, I assume that breaking the silence is, um, is one answer to that. Uh, I, I mean, it's, it's a political answer, but um, a lot of people in general do go towards some kind of activism. Um, and I think that a lot of... Um, what we're trying to do in breaking the silence is to uh, is to kind of process those experiences. I mean, we're not coming at it from a mental health point of view, but uh, we're trying to process the experiences that we've had uh, through the lens of a of a um, political uh, understanding that a lot of us have come to uh, come to receive uh, to obtain during our time that um, that we've served uh, and I'm sure that other people have done that uh, have taken that in different directions it'd be really in, it just just it's a little bit off your your area but if you could sort of give some other examples of kinds of at, at, activism of different kinds that people have become involved in mm -hmm. um, no. I also wanted to ask you something else is it, I'll, I'll say both questions at once which is I would imagine you would see yourself as no less a Zionist now than you were, than you always have been. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, I'll say that uh, I know a few people who have become very active in um, uh, environmental causes. Uh, and it's interesting that that's something that I'm not sure if it comes directly out of the army, but actually it's, it's maybe something of the experience of seeing different parts of the country where, which you're not used to. Um, or, or outside um, has uh, kind of brings people to understand different things about themselves and about what they're interested in. Um, as far as Zionism goes, uh, I think I I still define myself that way, um, uh, but my Zionism has changed, and I'm open about that. Uh, I still I definitely think that um, my uh, criticism of Israeli government policy uh, and uh, what my organization does is uh, a very natural expression of uh, support for the state of Israel because I think that um, what we're trying to say is that the occupation is not is not good for Israel and what we want is for Israel to succeed. Um, so I don't know if a lot of other Israelis would define their Zionism that way, but for me that's uh, I think a natural continuation of where I, where I started. It's just to say that that's, that, that resonates quite deeply um, with me, but it's quite a difficult position to articulate in a diaspora where there are plenty of people around mm -hmm. who have a very real hatred of the, of, the, of the existence of Israel at all. And I think people who find themselves in, you know, in that kind of, sector find it very hard to know very hard to open their mouths at all um mm -hmm. it's, it's important to hear to hear the different views um so far i don't think anybody's put a question in the chat so i'm going to actually ask you whether there's anything that each other has said that you want to pick up on or want to ask each other about or or just hear a little bit more about and matt is there anything we haven't drawn out which is very important that sort of we've missed um, so just give a little bit of pause for that. Um, First of all, if anyone would like to ask a question, please please do so now using the chat. Um, and I, I actually want I actually had two questions, if if I may, Rabbi Jonathan. Please. So one one was actually for for Avital and Alon to reflect on the same thing that you just spoke about, Joel. I'm interested, and if you've got anything to add, I'm interested in what your what Zionism means to you on a personal level. What does Zionism mean to you on a personal level? That's that's my first question. I had one more in a minute. Avital, are you happy to respond to Matt's question? Um, yeah, sure. Um, 
I think Zionism for me, uh, first of all, hasn't uh, really changed its definition, but haven't, hasn't really changed uh, before the army, during, and after. Um, I think, well, I guess maybe it's it's in during the army. It's really it's a thing. Before the army, it's not really a thing you think about every day. I I mean I was active in Noam, and it's something we talk about, and so I think it was in my mind and I, I talked about it but uh but like during the army it's really a time that you think it goes by your it go it goes by your thoughts uh every every once in a while and uh I think Zionism for me is has nothing really to do with any of the um questions of the conflict and Palestinians and Jews and and the, the whole the whole uh political issue. I think uh, it's a lot about uh, being a good citizen. And uh, I mean, before I got, I went to the army, I was, uh, I was volunteering. I did a gap year, Ashnat Shirut, um, through Noam. And I was, uh, I volunteered uh, a year with uh, kids with special needs and uh, elementary schools. And I think that's, I felt there a lot more like connected to my Zionism than even in the army. I think it's being it's being good citizen. It's being good to others. Um, it's it's uh, sharing the it's sharing those Jewish values um, with with the rest of society in Israel. In a sense of service. Yes, yeah. service and and uh, and just uh, spreading love and good, uh, not as a service, just as a way of life. It's impressive. Yeah, thank you. Alon, what would you say to Matt's, Matt's question? It's interesting. I, I, I very much relate, to Vital, to what you're saying, because I grew up again in a kibbutz and in Kfar Etzion and with the stories of my father was the head of the agriculture in the kibbutz, and I grew up in building the country and working the land, and, and that's Zionism. Uh, and I think that ever since I grew up, I think the country changed a little bit, and the need to build it has, for me at least, become second to the need to build the society and its health and the way it's, it's, it's acting and how we can uh, um, serve it, definitely serve it. I see myself, definitely my Zionism as in serving that goal of the, the Israeli society, the, the, the people and not the land. And I think that's, that very much drives me today and, and in peace of mind specifically as well. Thank you. Thank you. Matt, you had a second question. I did, but we actually have a question in the chat now, which I'm just looking at. Um, do you want to do you want to voice it, Matt? Sure. Um, yeah, so the, the question the question is from is from Diana and she says, I'll summarize a little bit. She says that the term Zionism tends to have negative connotations in the, in the UK now, um, certainly in the general population and, may, and among some bits of the Jewish community, I think, as well now. Um, uh, and the question is, how can we support Israel and still acknowledge that the state of Israel is, and these are the words of the question, how can we, how can we support Israel while still acknowledging that the state is built on somewhat dodgy ground? And I think, I think that's what the question is alluding to is, the tension between our desire to support Israel and believe in Israel and our recognition that there are deep problems in, in Israel as well, um, and sometimes problems of policy. I'm, I'd, I'll just add to the question, which is I'm, I'm aware that not all of you are involved in politics and don't want to talk about politics necessarily, so feel free to respond on a personal level um, or however you, however you want to take the question. I'm going to come to you, Joel, first, because you've lived in Britain for a lot of your life. Well, you know, this is in a way a question from the outside looking in rather than the inside looking out. Do you have a do you have a thought about that, Joel? Yeah, um, it's definitely something I thought about a lot, uh, especially over the last couple of years. Um, I think uh, I've kind of had a chance to review my um, like the the kind of support of Israel that I had when I was growing up and. Uh, and I think that there's there's some danger in defining Zionism in a kind of very narrow way, which makes uh, 
different kinds of opinions within that uh, illegitimate. And uh, that's something, unfortunately, that we've seen in Israel over the last few years, that it's become more difficult to criticize uh, while still staying within the, uh, the tent, so to speak. Um, and, and I think that it's, it's really important, actually, for our survival, as uh, n- not in an existential way, but just that our community is able to, to thrive uh, to be able to have discussions, even when it's difficult, and to be able to say we we can love and we can give and we can carry on um, doing our best uh, while also having criticism, and that's that's absolutely fine. Do either of you want to add to that, um, Alon, Avital, Avital? Well, it was no. Matt, there are a couple more questions. Do you want sure. to phrase them? We've got about another five or six minutes. So we okay, so time I'll, for a couple of questions. So I think with what, yeah, there are two, I think there are a couple more questions we can get to. So the first one is from Angela. Um, and Angela asks, she, she reflects that you've all shared um, experiences of some of the damaging effects of army service in different ways. Um, and she wonders what the alternative is, but specifically, is there one thing that you would like to see changed? So Alon, in a way, I'm going to begin with you and perhaps take this question to you and to Avital. I would say that um, being involved in con- in a violent conflict uh, is wherever it is in the, the West Bank and the borders, wherever it is, is in some way an unnatural thing as a psychologist and i'm not i'm not talking about political views at all but as a psychologist is something very difficult and something a little unnatural and i don't think i mean and i i don't want to um to open the question of yes we should make peace treaties and we should end wars and we should go that route because that's one aspect of it but that's not myself as a psychologist i would think that if people are there, we need to treat them well. And that's what we're trying to push to do. So if we can understand and if we can screen and if we can know what people need after such service to then again be fully uh, functioning civilians, uh, which are supporting the, the society and the state, that's what we should focus on. And that's, I think, what we're focusing on. Uh, and that I think there's a lot to do in that field. Thank you, Abitan. Um, it's hard. It's hard for me to answer that question uh, because just um, I don't know. In a, you know, like in the occupation about the occupation and what I would change and what I would change in army policy and I'm I don't I uh, I, I can't answer that question because I don't know my I I'm not hundred uh, percent comfortable with my with uh, I don't I don't I didn't uh, come together with my own. Uh, view of things, but I can say that I would that in my unit at least, um, while we were in the army and we and uh, we were serving in the West Bank and had interaction with Palestinians, we I never experienced uh, at least my with my friends and peers uh, any violent um, behavior or any situation of mistreating. Um, Palestinians and but I know I know that it, it exists and uh, and that it happens in the army and uh, and in general racism is the big problem uh, and I, I that of course I would like to change just treating people better and uh, and um, acting as respect as respectable and gracefully that people can be while doing these total these uh, difficult tasks in the army. Thank you. Matt, a last question to everybody, and then I think I'll try and bring things to a conclusion. Um, sure. So, so actually, it t- the, the last question I, I wanted to raise came from Yasmin, and it touched on what, Avital, you answered the question actually before you knew what it was. So maybe we can, maybe Alon or, or Joel, if you'd like to answer. The question was about racism, actually, and it's about whether you've encountered a culture of racism among Israeli soldiers um, during your time in the army and what impact that's had on the treatment of Palestinians. Um, so it'd be really interesting, I think, to hear your, your reflections on that. I think, Avital, I think you answered that already, really. Joe? 
Um, yeah, unfortunately, I came across racism in the army, but I, it's not um, necessarily representative of all soldiers at all. Um, the Israeli army really um, brings soldiers from a huge range of backgrounds, and some of them um, were very not racist, very much not racist. Um, uh, but again, I think that it's not, um, it's not really, when it comes to the treatment of the Palestinians, it's not really about the soldiers, even though the soldiers are the ones who make contact with the Palestinians. Uh, ultimately, the thing that most affects um, what happens on the ground and the lives of the Palestinians is the, is the policy. And that's something that, you know, the soldiers do what they're told and the commanders do what they're told. And it, ultimately, it, it comes from above, from the state. Uh, so I think uh, that's really the thing that has the, the most impact on uh, the treatment of Palestinians. Thank you. Alon. For me, it was interesting to hear at some point when I reflected on thousands of, of soldiers who went through our, our workshops, Never once did I hear the word hatred towards the enemy, if, if that's how they're looking. And, and again, enemy is because most of the guys that were with us were in, in, in active combat and wars and different, and different conflicts. And, and it's not, I didn't feel that way. And I didn't think that that's, what, that's what's driving them. And I don't think that that's uh, something that's driving the military, the state. I don't, I can't connect to that. Um, and I would, I don't know if we need to end, but I'm, I'm understanding that I didn't share the fact that many people talk about their military service as something that built them, as something that's given them tools for coping with all kinds of very big difficulties of life with connecting with people that they wouldn't have connected with, with enabling them to do things they wouldn't have dreamed doing. And people are taking many, many things from it. And I think that part of our, my work um, is to divide those things and to see what do you want to keep and what do you want to, to, to leave behind? Um, and how do you go, go ahead and become a better person, better civilian, better husband, better father after that? Um, so it's important for me to say, and I don't feel that racism is a, is a force, um, is, a, is a driving force in, the, in those places. It's really, it's actually very, very significant that we're going to close with those words from, 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 from both of you. And Avital, you said, you said similar, um, because one of the pressures here is the way Israel gets perceived and transmitted and the fact that you all said it's not about a culture of racism. Um, although one comes across racism, you know, as one does in any society, that's a very significant thing to say. And one of the challenges that we need to look at are kind of on home ground in Britain and elsewhere in Europe and America is, is you know, who forms what we mean by Zionism? and how we create our own understanding of it in a, in a subtle and thoughtful and positive and nuanced way. And that's something we will continue to look at over the next two of these sessions and you know, in studies in the future years. And I wanna thank Matt Flynn and everybody in Sword to Judaism for organizing this, this series. And I want very, very much to, to, to thank you, Abital and Joel and Alon for sharing, you know, you know, quite responding to some quite pushy questions from me and from others, which take you to experiences that most of us listening haven't had and which are complicated and for which we respect and admire you. So thank you very much. Thank you very, very much indeed. And I hope we can, you know, Abital, if you come to Britain, you'd be very welcome. Joel, you know that. Um, you're down the road. Um, and Alon, we can't wait to have another group of peace of mind. So we're going to close now, and the next session, as Matt has put in the chat, is at seven um, next week on Sunday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.